This episode of Hodinki Radio is brought to you by Accutron and the new DNA Casino Collection. With 100 pieces made in four vibrant colors, the Accutron DNA Casino perfectly fuses futuristic watchmaking and bold design. Stay tuned later in the show for more on the brand's new collection, or visit AccutronWatch.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Hodinki Radio. I'm excited to be in the New York office today with Two giants of the watch industry, really, sitting in... One and a half. We'll say one, one and, and a half. one, I'm the half, yeah. Um, sitting on the couch here to my right, we've got the CEO of Breitling and Universal Geneva, I suppose, as well, George Kern. Thank you so much for joining us today, George. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. We appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got a busy schedule whenever you come to New York. Um, and I've also got to my right, Mr. Ben Clymer. Hey, guys. Happy to be here. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I think we're just going to get right into it, George, if that's okay. No problem. I hinted at it already, and you kind of set the watch world on fire towards the end of 2023 when you announced that Breitling had acquired Universal Genève. There was so much excitement from the watch community, from enthusiasts, to see Universal Genève back in Swiss hands. Can you talk about how that felt? Yes, it was, even for us, a little bit of a surprise. I mean, we knew, and it's why we we, we tried to, and, and we finally acquired the brand, we knew about the history, about the emotions around that brand and the potential, obviously, of reviving it. But then when the announcement was made, I was submerged, and all of us, with emails, uh, messages. It was absolutely unbelievable, the, the, the direction also of the press, of the financial press, because... Um, you know, it's an interesting um, you know, company with pri- which is privately owned, etc. It was incredible, incredible. Take us a little bit behind the deal as much as you'd like. You know, it was a reported 60 million Swiss francs, I believe. And over the years, there have been so many rumors of collectors, enthusiasts, other CEOs trying to acquire Universal Genève, which has been in, in Hong Kong hands since, since 1989. Can you talk about what it was about Breitling's offer and, and the potential there that, that made it successful for you guys? Um, I think the current owners have a very strong emotional link to the brand. Uh, the family was involved since the 50s um, uh, with Universal Genève. And they obviously we shared our vision on how we wanted to relaunch it. And I think when you sell a house you, where you, you lived, you want the new buyer to respect uh, that house. And I think we were able to uh, explain what we wanted to do and how we, we see the future of the brand. And then um, they, they liked all these ideas and they decided to sell it to us because you're right, there were many other bidders uh, around this brand. We're going to get into everything you've done at Breitling over the past six plus years in a moment. And I'm sure perhaps there's there's some hints there, um, digging into the history and the archives and the heritage of the brand. But talk about the vision you have for Universal Genève. I mean, we bought that, I mean, we looked at many brands, you know, we looked at many brands, also new brands, but I'm convinced that you need history, you need uh, iconic designs, you need iconic uh, stories uh, if you want to be successful. And uh, it would be stupid not to use all the heritage of Universal Genève, be it in designs, be it in, in, in stories, uh, and, and not use it to revive the brand as it should be. Um, also, they have some, or they had some very specific movements in the old days, which we're going to rebuild, obviously, uh, and redo. Why would we pay so much money or buy that brand if we would not build on the history on the concepts uh, of, of that brand, that would be really stupid. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the movements and the heritage that, that you're kind of referencing there? I think in our, our article announcing the news, uh, your brand historian Fred Mandelbaum said something to the effect of, you won't see uh, commercial or mass-produced movements in Universal Genève's. Um, and I know he has been sort of instrumental in, in helping you understand the, the history of Chronographs, especially at Breitling, and, and Universal Genève's history is, is much the same with their chronographs, um, their micro rotors, and the pole routers like those I'm wearing. I think if, I, if I'm correct, Ben has a chronograph on right now from yeah. Universal Genève. Yeah. Uh, talk about that type of heritage uh, and, and how you'll be sort of looking at relaunching that. So definitely, I mean, there were a couple of rumors, but I can't, and I said it right from the beginning, uh, 
first of all, this brand will be merged uh, separately from uh, from Breitling. So we're building a team separately from Breitling mm -hmm. in terms of design, uh, product development, technique, etc. And at a certain stage, there will be a CEO, etc. So it will be um, it will be different. And sooner or later, the brand will also be located in Geneva. And um, and yes, you you mentioned the pole router, you mentioned the the micro rotor. Um, we're going to put together an advisory board with with very knowledgeable people. I think uh, beyond the fact to ask yourself what should I do, the question is what are the mistakes I should avoid in relaunching that brand. And there will be many discussions in terms of pricing, in terms of uh, sizes, uh, in terms of design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, we had an advisory board for, for with Breitling, and we've put together a new advisory board for Universal Genève with really great people, um, and um, and and we'll discuss about all that. We have a thesis what we want to do, obviously, and we're going to test these thesis uh, very soon with with these people in different areas in terms of design collection, because also let's not forget um, the collection or what. Universal uh, developed is very wide, but what are the essentials? What you obviously pole router, the compacts, the tree compacts, Nina Rind. I mean, all this is obvious, but then there are less obvious uh, products we need to discuss. I guess a, qu a question I would have mostly as a, as a collector of Universal, and Universal was was my first love. I started buying it because I couldn't afford Patek when I first started, and I got much of the same uh, feel. Is is it really the? I mean, I'm, I'm actually looking at a uni Universal ad on the wall, which we did not place there for your benefit. It's been there for ten years. Um, that's a tricompax, right? This is to me the iconic Universal design. It's something that in, in many ways feels almost dated and out of step with today, maybe. Uh, by if you're looking at what sells the best, which is steel sports watches, would a product like that have uh, the same cachet today as it did in the 1940s? Obviously, Patek, Lange, certain brands can do very high-end, complicated formal watches. But uh, again, I don't know the price point of what we're thinking about here. But would a product like like that, you think, resonate the same way today as it would in the 40s or 50s? No, absolutely. I, um, otherwise, we we wouldn't have done it. Um, we obviously in relaunching it. We want to do things differently, especially in that price point, than the brands which are positioned there. But these products were beautiful. I don't know anybody who has seen the products of that time who wouldn't agree that these are amazing products. Also in advertising, uh, Le Couturier de la Montre. I mean, there's so many things, but of course you have to modernize it. It has to be contemporary. And what you have done in the 60s cannot be applied uh, uh, as of today, but you know, uh, Porsche was also is not the same car as sure. it is today. Yeah. So of course we have to 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 build on on the history, but it has to be contemporary. Um, and these are there are a couple of deta details we need to discuss. One of the points is you're right. How elegant or how sporty should that uh, brand be, right. considering? The, um, considering the reality of the market of today. On the other side, you could argue, but let's do something totally different right. because there's a market which nobody's tapping in. But I will not say everything now because uh, let's surprise the market when we will be ready. And the, the, the positioning, and I, there, there's been a lot of... of I wouldn't say hearsay because I think Fred and some others kind of mentioned, or maybe yourself even mentioned, kind of the the price positioning of it. It'll be effectively a little bit more expensive than than Breitling. Is, is well, yeah, for sure, for sure. Because uh, developing uh, these these movements um, uh, is very expensive. These movements will be significantly more expensive. So than, these will be all in-house movements. I mean, all new movements. Yeah, this, wow. it will be. It's one of the discussions we need to have. You know, when you say le couturier de la montre, it could be prêt-à-porter and haute couture. Right. I think we should have both. We should have prêt-à-porter and haute couture. Yeah. Um, but there will be many, many new movements, of course. And it has to be, it, it, it has to reflect the idea of the universal Genève of that time. As, again, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Why? Then we could have created a new brand or, or take a brand of today. No, we wanted that brand. Yeah. 
And, and I discussed with Fred, he gave me two names. I will not tell you the other name. Yeah. He's, he gave me two brands to buy. I asked him, yeah. which ones should we buy? And he, gave me, and he said, if there's one brand to buy, it's Universal Genève. For sure. It took me nearly 18 months to get it. Yeah. Um, so um, we're very happy about that. No, it's, I mean, j just as somebody who's been observing the industry for 16 years now, th this is the coup of, of my lifetime in watches, for sure. I mean, what, what you did in, in acquiring Universal. So many people have come to me over the years saying we should do this. I mean, I've heard other, other big groups that you may or may not be very familiar with have tried. Um, you know, it's really, this is a, a, a major coup, I think, for, I would imagine, for you personally and certainly professionally. I, I cannot share this here now, but I got a couple of SMS and WhatsApp yeah. from very, very, very famous people. Sure of the industry, of the luxury industry, yeah. and the watch industry, and they said, this is the acquisition of the century. It, it is. It really is. And, and no, no But this is why we, we have to be very careful yeah. how we relaunch it. And this is why I want to have a very uh, reflected discussion on how we should do it. Yeah. 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 It, th there, there's, I don't want to say there's a lot of pressure on you, but th there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of importance just because of how much this brand means to so many of us. Yeah. You know? And I, th I know you take it very seriously. And it's amazing to hear that, the, that there will be new movements. I think that the great fear among collectors such as myself, Tony, Fred, et cetera, would be that it's just uh, revived in namesake only and kind of off-the-shelf no, no. movements. Uh, it's amazing to hear that there'll be in-house movements for sure. What, what are some of your favorite universals, if you can share? Uh, I mean, um, I, lo I love the whole concept of the pole router. Yeah. You know, I think Gerald Genta was 27 when he designed it, right. which is quite incredible. Yeah. And the watch is so recognizable right. and uh, so versatile because you can do a super elegant watch and you can do a more, a watch with more muscles if you want. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I like the Nina Rint. I'm, I'm trying to buy one actually. <laughs> 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 but I had one in mind, but Fred told me, no, no, the, the crown is not the, the real one. This yeah, is not the yeah. real one. So, um, and I have her contact now. I'm going to send her an email. Uh, we are, we're trying to interview her and um, to, um, you oh, know. You Nina is. Yeah, Nina. Oh, got it. That's she, she is still alive. She's, yeah. I think, around 80 years old. She's yeah, living in right. Sweden. Yep. Makes sense. And um, I just got the email, her email address yesterday, actually. Fine. So I'm going to contact her on my way back to Switzerland. That's super fun. Have you seen, I had a, I have a buddy who posted a photo of, of Nina Rintz, Nina Rintz. So it's out there on the internet. It's interesting because it has different hands than like what you would expect on a Nina Rintz, probably replaced at some point because I think she legitimately wore the watch no, and absolutely. used it and stuff like that. Um, but that's super cool. That's super cool. No, and, and I'm also going to visit the building, you know, the original building um, of uh, Universal Genève, uh, there's a huge architectural uh, office in oh. there now, close to Geneva. Cool. And I've contacted the people, and they um, will see. Perhaps we can <laughs> move in again. I don't know. That would be cool. Yeah, be but um, the 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 fun part of it, it belongs to Rolex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so good luck. Yeah. So yeah. I need to talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you kind of hinted at it here with. Uh, being slow and deliberate and developing your own movements, but timeline-wise, we probably can't expect anything uh, as far as product in at least a couple of years. Twenty twenty-six. Okay, okay. Well, Ben, do you want to leave the Universal Genève discussion there and talk about Breitling a little bit? I guess so. I could talk it, about UG all day long. I could talk about Universal all day. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I know you won't say yes or no, but the the Corelli split second, the twenty-four hour dial split second. How can you not, right? I think we need first to start with the automatic. Yeah. The 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 chronos will take even. I mean, we need we will need uh, three years to have a proper automatic. Yeah. In you know, just like a time only automatic. You mean? Yeah. And 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 the chrono will take more time, hand wound and and and, and uh, automatic and uh, and then all the complications. But as I said, there are a couple of obvious things we need to do. And we need also, but we also need to discuss about the ladies' line. I mean, it's it's such a, it's it's so rich. Right. In a way, I felt like when I joined Breitling, I was overwhelmed. I didn't realize uh, how rich this. I mean, I obviously I had some knowledge, but not in detail. And it came, and we were. Con I was contacted by so many collectors. I mean, dozens and dozens of sure. people. There's one guy who was one thousand five hundred 
Universal Genève. Can you imagine 1,500? That might be too many universes. Uh, <laughs> That's a and, lot. <laughs> and, and all the auction houses, yeah, yeah. everybody wants to do something, sure, yeah. Yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But we need to step back, right. to have a proper plan, to talk to you know, to, 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 to have th these discussions with the advisory board and, and, and not to make mistakes, not to go too quick, to do it right, clean, proper. I think this can be one of the most amazing relaunches in the watch industry of the last 30, 40 years. I, I, th I think it's yours for the taking, for sure. I, I really do. I guess one, one question I had about Universal, one more, and then we can go on to Breitling. <laughs> so is it confirmed? Because I, you know, the, the idea that Georges Gente designed the Polar Reuter in his 20s, that has been passed around the internet, probably perpetuated by our own site for years. Is that confirmed? Have, have you guys done that, that diligence? Um, we have... We have some. Uh, we we did some legal checks, yeah. and uh, from the letters and the contracts I have, yes. Wow. Actually, we checked if we have the rights, if we bought the rights, because at that time he did. It's incredible. He did designs for a couple of hundred Swiss francs. Uh, <laughs> a couple of hundred Swiss francs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a yeah. couple of hundred Swiss francs. Yeah. And we have uh, different correspondence, which actually underlines that he designed that watch, yes. Wow, that's, that's pretty neat, for sure. With the acquisition, did you get all kinds of different archival documents and things like that that are going to help tell, tell the story of UG yes. in a way that we've not expected? Yes, because there's an incredible community, yeah. and they, they, they're all extremely keen to participate in the process and to... Um, submit and 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 share uh, material. Uh, it was the same thing when I joined, uh, at the, you know, in the old days, IWC, etc., or or Brightling. Suddenly, all this pops up, right? Yeah. Oof. And people, uh, because people are keen and, as you said, are extremely emotionally attached to this brand. Yeah, no question. So uh, yeah, we're excited that Hodinki Radio is back. And our return is thanks in part to this week's sponsor, Accutron, and its new DNA Casino Collection. Driven by the world's first electrostatic energy movement, the new Accutron DNA Casino Collection fuses vibrant colors with futuristic design. The four bold new colors, each limited to 100 pieces, are inspired by the bright lights of Las Vegas. The DNA is an update of Accutron's original icon, the Space View, the watch known for its revolutionary tuning fork movement. The DNA updates the Accutron Space View for the modern era with a 45mm stainless steel case and integrated rubber strap. Since introducing the world's first fully electronic watch in 1960, Accutron has continued to push the boundaries of timekeeping. The Accutron DNA Casino Collection synthesizes bold colors, innovative technology, and a retro-futuristic design to make a bold statement. Accutron. It's not a timepiece, it's a conversation piece. Check out the new DNA Casino Collection on AccutronWatch.com or the new Citizen Flagship Store in New York. A big thanks to Accutron for its support, and now, back to the show. So I, I think I want to move to Breitling and just talk about, first of all, what you view as kind of your, your biggest success with the brand in your time as CEO there now. In a way, and this might sound surprising, I think we are much more faithful to the brand today uh, than the brand ever was because we're using the full scope of the brand you know as you know we've relaunched the premier the premier we've relaunched the top time uh, the super ocean is inspired by the slow motion we're very faithful to the brand so in a way we we have reinvented the brand but based on an incredible back catalog we became a journalist uh, watch brand, so we offer from a very classic product, the premier to obviously the uh, emergency technology product, which makes it also very different. There are no, I don't know any journalist watch brand out there, and um, and it works. Whilst people told me always, no, you have to have a backbone, etc. It's, it's, it's nonsense. You have to be what the brand is. You cannot decide to be a journalist if you have a mono product, and you cannot right. be a mono brand if you have such a history as Breitling. And all the lines are successful. Obviously, obviously the Navi timer is commercially and financially the most successful line, but everything sells. 
And uh, I don't know one single person walking into our boutique who doesn't like at least one of our lines. It doesn't exist. Right. I, I think it might be helpful, and if you can, and if it's private, I understand. Could you frame the level of growth that you've seen? Like, where was the brand when you took over, and then where is it now in terms of sales or turnover, or whatever you're comfortable with? I mean, we, we, we more, more than doubled uh, turnover, and we've dramatically improved uh, profitability. Obviously, you know the valuation of the company has been... Um, increasing i mean cbc bought, bought the company at that time i mean it was in all the newspapers for for 800 million we now partners group uh, entered at 4.2 uh, uh, 5 billion so the valuation is is incredible uh, because the profitability is there the cash flow is there yeah. growth is there obviously now for i mean in the whole world you have headwinds in in terms of uh, of economic environment, sure. inflation, uh, exchange rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the the question is, in in uh, when you have headwinds, you gain market share, which we do. Uh, we are in nearly in every country in in the top uh, three, top four, top five brands. So it's and and we have ideas for the next hundred years. I mean, yesterday we gave another push to our latest segment with yeah. Victoria Beckham, et cetera, which was very successful. Yeah. She's a big deal. Uh, yeah, and and it it's um, obviously now we, we, we're lucky a little bit with her series on Netflix and, and everything she's doing with, with David, who was, by the way, uh, was a Breitling guy. A, a Breitling guy. I remember, yeah. So, uh, yes, I think we opened the brand. We opened the brand. We, we, we were in a kind of prison. We opened it, and um, and this is helping us today to do all of these things, which probably many other brands couldn't do. It would be weird, but it fits. Uh, it fits Breitling. What does Breitling still need to get better at or improve at? I mean, now what we're going to do, and we have the 140th uh, jubilee this year. We we will work in marketing terms. You talk about esteem, all right? We are very relevant. We are a modern brand. We are appealing brand. We have. Uh, Probably we have very nice boutiques, cool advertising, and this year you will uh, we will launch a new automatic in-house movement. We will be 100% uh, um, manufacture. Um, we will uh, now build, uh, and we're going to launch the, the first type of products this year. Build complications on our in-house movements on on the B01, and uh, all of this will uh, come out. Uh, this year, uh, during the Jubilee, we're going to have a pop-up museum. We're going to have travel exhibitions. We're going to tell much more about um, our manufacturing capabilities. We are going to talk about, uh, we, as I said, we're launching new movements. All of this is, is important. But five, six years ago, we first had to become relevant again for the market. It was a very... Uh, niche brand, very macho, a little outdated in terms of image, in terms of products. And thank God we changed all of this successfully. And now we have to give reassurance uh, to the client on, on many levels, which we're going to do. I think around the time you joined, probably five, six years ago, um, in-house was, was the talk of the town, right? Everyone wanted in-house movements for this or that reason and the perception that it was better. And it's been a focus of, of what you've done, um, the B01, and now you're talking about a new in-house automatic and, and really beefing up your manufacturing capabilities. But I'm curious if you've seen the consumer interest or the consumer demand for that change over the past few years. For me, it's a conditio sine qua non. At that level where we are, we're one of the biggest chronograph manufacturers in the world. And we would be one of the biggest, because of the quantities we're selling, uh, automatic, uh, manufacturers in the world. The point is, people expect that from you. You know, it's it's, uh, and it's table stakes. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, I think it's more a surprise when we don't have it than having it, and it has to be part of it. And and it's also a question of independence, etc., uh, etc. Et and um, it's 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 part of the growth of the company. You were asking, what do we have to do in future? And this is it. I mean, our average price when I joined the company. Our average price was around four thousand dollars. Our average price now um, selling price is six thousand nine hundred. Wow. Uh, so it's it's totally different, and we know we we see how much more gold we sell. We see how much you know the Avengers, the best selling products are the the ceramic, are the expensive products. Um, 
So we have this um, this potential also to go into other price points, even though we don't we don't want to overshoot, right? We will have a Universal Genève for that, you know, for the for the more expensive pieces, and and I think where we are, let's say between five and fifteen thousand, is exactly the sweet spot in terms of pricing, and and we want to stay there. Right. A frequent point of discussion we see on on our website and just talking to collectors, honestly, is the way in which brands have moved their price points uh, up market a little bit, uh, in addition to just the the larger macroeconomic environment, I suppose. But I'm curious if you feel as though you're leaving anything behind when you go from an average of four to six. Um, but it's a different... I think you can increase pr prices if you have a better offering. For instance, Navi Timer, we, when we relaunched the Navi Timer, we, we stopped with Celita and Valjou, right? And we went fully... B01, same thing with the Avenger. And um, it's a different movement, it's a different engine. Um, and you, 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 you can justify the price. And it was extremely well, um, it was extremely well accepted. But yes, you're leaving that price point of a chrono at 5,000. Um, um, so now probably you will ask, should you should you buy a brand? Do your job that? for me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> the follow-up. Yep. Yep. <laughs> should we buy a brand doing that? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, why but not? let me yeah. first focus on Universal, yeah. and then we'll see uh, you know, other opportunities. You're just fanning the rumors now, so we appreciate that. I'm not fanning that. anything. <laughs> <laughs> Historical brand, or what do you think? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going into that yeah. discussion. <laughs> <All right. laughs> not yet. Yeah, yeah. We'll conjecture later. Yeah. As a CEO and as an entrepreneur, uh, you, you worked at a large brand group for, for a long time, almost two decades before, before joining Breitling, which, as we mentioned, is, is owned by private equity, um, is, is independent. Uh, can you just talk about the, the different experiences as, as a business person running brands in, in those two different environments? Um, so you have to differentiate between my personal feeling and then what it means for a company to be independent or to be part of a group. As 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 a as from my personal um, point of view, this has been an incredible journey. I mean, I love it. I have uh, with CVC, I had incredible investors. They they, they trust uh, trusted in in our um, strategy. It has been doing. I mean, they, they made a lot of money, obviously, but they support us. Same thing, partners group. It's it's a total different way of working. You know, it's it's you cannot compare privately owned company uh, from a company which is uh, part of a group. Uh, we are much quicker, you know, decision process is, is 15 minutes when, when, you, when you talk to, to, right. to the right people, etc., which I think is a huge advantage for, for a company. On the other side, so for us in terms of manager, as, as managers, and we have many shareholders, it's not only me, I mean, there are many other, all my colleagues are shareholders in, in, uh, in Breitling. So it's very motivating. So that's one part of it. Of course, you have advantages and disadvantages being independent. When you're part of a big group, you have the power of, a group, of, of the group, of the brands towards the distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but perhaps you're less flexible and, and, and it's, uh, the decision, decision process is longer, what is not the case with us. Uh, so in terms of business model, I think both have advantages and these are the advantages for me as a person or for my team it's much more fun to work for a private company what's the biggest disadvantage to being independent privately owned as i said you're single at least we were a single uh, a brand and you have less power towards distribution than when you are part of a group you know where you have where you can talk about different brands with, with, with a partner or with a real estate company, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the brand, after a while, becomes so successful that this fades away. Yeah. And now with Universal, I mean, I, there's not one single retailer who hasn't uh, reached out, <laughs> reach yeah. out yeah. to yeah. us I believe uh, yeah. to have the brand, right? So this fades out after a while. And and I mean, there are many brands in the top five. Uh, most of them are independent companies. Right. But you need to to be successful. If you're weak as an inter independent brand, it's getting very tough. Yeah. A question we like to ask is removing Rolex because Rolex, we all know, is doing quite well. 
What is a brand that you really admire and what do you like about what they're doing? No, there are many brands I admire yeah. um, for, for totally different reasons. Yeah. But I like Cartier. I mean, I think they're doing an incredible job. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, Even with men all of a sudden. It's, it's, I like Cyril. I know him since many years. Sure. He's a great guy. There are many brands f- you know, from my previous group, which, which I like. Um, and, um, but I also admire and I like as a person, Richard Mille. You know, he's a very fun guy. Sure. I met him <laughs> several times. Yeah. And um, no, there are many, but for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've seen so many brands and I, I, was, I had the opportunity to interact with so many brands in my life. Uh, and I wish them all. I wish them all luck and success. Right. I think it's important for 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 Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. It, Can I ask you? There's been such a push towards Cartier, but also just elegance and dress watches more broadly in the past few years has been such an interest for the the collector and enthusiast community. Um, it's it's not sort of the core of what Breit- Breitling is known for right now. You're known for your sports watches and your chronographs. When did, when is it that you see a trend towards? something like that or an aesthetic like that and think about how it might inform your, your product? I think as a brand, you, you need to keep your identity. You know, we, we are not, Breitling is not an elegant, we, we are not positioned as an elegant watch. We want to be the cool and relaxed alternative to the more conservative brands out there. We are in surfing, we are in triathlon. I mean, we are in rugby. We, we, are, we, we are not in flat watches, you know, in, 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 this is not our, right. it's not our identity. And we have to stick to our identity, but then within that identity, you can you can have uh, a Navi Timer or Super Ocean or Super Ocean Heritage or an Avenger, as long as there is a career and style. And that was a difficulty for Breitling or for for us when we took over five six years ago. You have a puzzle which was aviation watches only, hardcore. Um, a little macho, and then suddenly you change the brand and you take elements of the puzzles away and the image d- becomes blurred and people are starting to doubt what they're doing. And it takes two or three years to change, let's say, 60 70% of the elements of the puzzle to start a new image. And I think we've re- now we're at 99%. But we have that image, we have that identity, and we need to keep it. It works. We have a proven concept. It works. It's successful. And uh, but we shouldn't change it again towards something uh, even more elegant, which I don't think reflects the brand. There are many brands out there which are much better than than us in in, in going into that direction. How elegant? Universal Genève will be, or Sporty, is this, I don't know, you right, You asked the right question. It's a key question. It's a key question. Yeah. Taking the even broader view, you've been in the space for more than 20 years now. Can you just talk about some of the, the changes you've observed in the watch industry over, over the years? I think you, you, you touched it um, when you were talking about movements. I remember when I, um, when I was at Tag Heuer, Tag Heuer, at that time when I joined uh, Tag Heuer, it was in uh, probably <clears throat> 91, 92. Tag was the first company doing image campaigns and running image campaigns with Don't Crack Under Pressure, with Success It's a Mind Game. At that time, it was really the movement. You know, movement, design, image. And today, people are buying a brand and a movement is a conditio sine qua non. It's like you're not going to Hermes to buy a Kelly bag and you're not asking for the quality of the leather, right? I mean, it's That's it, for sure. it's, yeah. it's there. In a way, at our level, people expect super quality, super service, in-house movements, etc. But it totally changed. The, uh, and also when I worked with Günther Blümlein at that time, it was very much, who, who as you know, Build the IWC and, and Langonzone. It's very much about the movement, absolutely, etc. But I think the biggest change is that the brand became so important. The image of the brand became so important, and other elements uh, are still important, but are considered as being given. 
and which was not the case 20 years ago. Right, that makes sense. Listen, I wanted to I wanted to lighten things up a little bit before we let you go. Uh, if I read your bio correctly, you've got some film production credits. Um, I know cinema is a bit of a passion of yours. Is this is this correct? Did I read this right? No, no, it's correct. Okay. I produced a movie in France, yeah. um, which was quite su successful with Charlotte Gainsbourg, who is the daughter of Serge Gainsbourg, who was an ambassador of uh, of writing, by the way, like Miles Davis and others. Yeah. And it's uh, in uh, it's based on a on a famous novel of from John Fante called My Dog Stupid. Now we're doing the series, but in English in England, and I have other projects. So you know, people have hobbies, and in the industry, you have people doing yeah. cheese. You have, <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. Of course, you have of people course. doing wine. <laughs> I'm 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 producing movies, yeah. and um, it's it's uh, I love it. Yeah, I'm going to Ben's Vineyard right after this. It'll be great. You can come along <laughs> if joke, you want. By the way, no vineyard, <laughs> yeah. no vineyard here for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, with that, I wanted to ask for a, a film or a TV recommendation. Something maybe you watch it on the plane on the way to New York, or something you've got lined up for your flight tonight. Um, uh. I mean, the best series I just finished the last season for me, and and it won all the prizes. Is is uh, Succession? Yeah, of I, I, I loved it. And uh, I did. I I saw uh, Napoleon. I didn't like it at all, to be honest, mm. um, because I I'm, I'm I'm half French, so I know the story, and I think it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's not um, accurate. Uh, it was very unfair. But no, I like I like on all series. I I loved Ozark. I mean, there are a couple of series which are very cool, um, and um, it's 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 a source of inspiration. By the way, you know, it's it's interesting to look. I I like to look what is happening in the, in, the, in the movie industry, what is happening in the car industry in terms of designs, in terms of colors. You need to get inspiration. Fashion, I love fashion. To come back on, on, on Victoria Beckham, what she's doing and how she changed her style and um, became so successful. It's super interesting to talk to people who are a little bit outside of uh, your core industry but still close because it's all luxury and it's very transversal you cannot we sh you shouldn't look at the watch industry as a silo somebody who's interested in watches in, is interested in cars is interested hopefully in art or in fashion etc and you have a much more or you need in my opinion to have a much more transversal understanding on what is going on in our society what the trends are also after covid you know I wouldn't do events today, for instance, at Brightling as I did five or 10 years ago, and you probably attended a couple of them, sure. but it wouldn't be appropriate, uh, appropriate in, in, in our time. So you have to understand what is going on in the society uh, and, and what trends there are, colors, materials, what is going on, because it's all, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a global thinking you need to have, I think. I, I wholeheartedly agree, and I think it's also part of the fun part of when you're learning about the history of a brand like UG or Breitling, you're learning about the context in which these watches were made in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, and it, it, it just makes it so much richer when you discover brands in that way. It's a very important point, by the way, when we'll talk about Universal, not to turn this into a vintage brand. I think that's, that would be a terrible mistake. Terrible mistake. I agree. Well, George, thank you so much for taking your time or taking time out of your day to, to come by the Hodinkee office. Ben, thank you as well. Thank you, guys. Um, I think we enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for shedding some light on your plans at Universal Geneva and, and everything you've been up to at Breitling. Um, thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>